Yeah, so welcome back to the Kazimiram Dialogue podcast. Uh, it's good to have you again. Um, Thank you yeah, very so, much. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess um, we should just uh, move right into some of the questions. So um, I guess you've, you've recently released a book um, called The Nature of Human Persons, Metaphysics and Bioethics. And I, I know that like a large part of your philosophical work has focused <clears throat> on bioethics. And I'm, I'm just curious, what, motiva what motivated you to write an account of the metaphysics of the, human, of the human person in relation to bioethics? Like, where did that start? Yeah, um, honestly, it's, it's, it started uh, really at, right at the beginning for me. So when um, I was first studying philosophy as an undergrad and a master's student, uh, my main interests were in uh, philosophy of religion, philosophy of mind, and metaphysics. And, and even though I took a, I think I took three ethics classes as an undergrad, but ethics was really never like the main interest for me. Um, and so when I started my doctoral studies at St. Louis University, um, I came to SLU specifically to work with Professor Eleanor Stump and to work on Aquinas and metaphysics and philosophy of religion. And, and I was really interested primarily in the metaphysics of persons and the mind-body relationship, uh, questions about the soul and post-mortem existence, those types of things. But then my very first semester in graduate school, I took a seminar uh, with a Jesuit priest who's uh, now deceased, uh, Father John Cavanaugh. And his course, it was a, on Aquinas' natural law. And as part of it, we read this book um, by a philosopher named Eric Olson called The Human Animal personal identity without psychology. And I was really fascinated with this, this notion of animalism as a contrast to what, what you mostly see, especially in a lot of Christian metaphysical thought, the uh, dualist notion of the person-body or mind-body relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and, and dualism never sat right with me. Um, and so I was really intrigued by Olson's uh, animalist approach. But that I also found unsatisfying because um, he takes a very reductive approach um, to, to we are just our animal, <clears throat> animal bodies and that's it. Yeah. So, um, and so as a, obviously I'm studying Aquinas, I'm learning about, you know, Aquinas' uh, hylomorphic theory of the soul body relation, the soul informing the body. And, um, and, and it seems to, you know, again, bring the best of both worlds course you also get objections from both sides so yeah. hylomorphism gets attacked by both material reductive materialists and dualists um, but so that was you know the, the main question I was interested in and already knew by the end of that course I want to write my dissertation on that but I ended up writing my term paper for that class um, the as part of Olson's argument he was talking about this uh, this argument uh, about twinning with respect to pre-implantation embryos. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that um, you have an embryo formed at conception, uh, the zygote, right, like the one-celled um, entity, and then it splits uh, into multiple cells forming what's called a blastocyst. Mm -hmm. And up until about two weeks or so post-conception, the, the embryo at this stage, the blastocyst, can potentially split into identical twins. Right? Yeah. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but that's when it can happen. And so based on this and the, and the bringing the metaphysics of identity and so on, Olson basically argues that we can't consider the pre-implantation embryo to be a singular unified organism in this pre-implantation state. And I just found that yeah. argument fascinating. I wasn't quite sure yet whether I agree with it or not, but I just, you know, again, as a metaphysician, I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. Yeah. So I ended up writing my paper on, on that topic of the ontological status of pre-implantation embryos. And unbeknownst to me, because again, I'm not observing what's happening in the bioethics realm, I'm writing this paper in fall 1998, and that's around the same time that, that the, the huge debate over human embryonic stem cell research was just kicking off. Right. And so I sent this paper off to be published to a, a journal called Bioethics. Look, I didn't even know it was like one of the top journals in the field and Peter Singer yeah. founded it and all those things. Long story short, it got published. Mainly because, you know, it was on the, the hottest topic of the day. Like I said, it was kind of accidental uh, on my part. 
and my wife um, ever concerned with how I'm going to make a living as a Thomist metaphysician <laughs> right. wisely said bioethics that's what's going to get you a job um, so that, that's a lot of personal backstory but the whole idea is that this is this is where I found my passion this marrying of my interests as a Thomist as a metaphysician into these bioethical issues where these ont questions of ontology are really driving the debate of course there's the ethics part of it too um, I always say that the metaphysics informs but doesn't dictate the ethics and right yeah so that's that's kind of where the the genesis for this book comes from okay um, so yeah you're you would say you take a, like a Thomist account of human nature and I guess like how, how would that contrast um, with say like a substance dualism um, or sort of a non-reductive materialism that you know that seems to be quite popular in academic and popular philosophy today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, just for, for the sake of any listeners who aren't familiar with these different uh, isms out there, um, so substance dualism, as I'm sure you know, is the, uh, the view that a human person, a human being, is identical to an immaterial soul or mind, right? This is very much uh, in the lineage, goes back to, to Plato, uh, sometimes referred to as Cartesian dualism, although it's it's really the Cartesian dualism of the second meditation. By the time you get to the sixth meditation, Descartes almost sounding more like a hylomorphist. That's mm -hmm. kind of an internal debate among Cartesians, but but definitely Plato, right? Plato, you know, has uh, the image of the, the the pilot driving the ship, right? Um, yeah. Or today we talk about you driving your car, right? So your body is just your vehicle that you get around the world in. Um, and the famous death scene from the, the Phaedo, right? As Socrates is drinking the hemlock and, and dying, um, I think it's Crato asks, um, you know, how, how would you like us uh, to dispose of you, right? To, uh, of your body after you're dead. And Socrates, it, it, it's, it's a great scene because he's literally dying and he laughs at Crato. And yeah. he says, do whatever you want with me, assuming you can catch me because I'm not going to be here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, so that's, that's dualism. And uh, Aquinas directly attacks uh, Platonic dualism. Um, of course, it's it gone through some more Neoplatonic um, iterations, but uh, still very much uh, close to Plato's original uh, theory. And, the, and, and the, the way that the, the problem Aquinas has with it is that if you cling to this dualistic notion, you destroy the unity of the human person um, because human persons are naturally embodied. Um, like I said, by, when you get to the sixth meditation, Descartes, he's, you know, once he got to the point where he says, right, so in the second meditation, Descartes says, um, you know, he can doubt everything his senses tell him, his senses tell him that he has a body. Of course, if he's having a vivid dream, he also imagines as being having a body in that dream. But then when he gets to the point where he, he can now trust what he clearly and distinctly perceives, he says in Meditation 6, I clearly and distinctly perceive nothing so clearly as that I have a body, that I'm intimately united with this body. Mm -hmm. It's so kind of talking the dualistic language of I and my body. So again, like me and my car. Yeah. But again, this notion of intimate union with the body that starts to sound a bit more hylomorphic. Um, so, so the idea then with, uh, with Aquinas, if we kind of think of this, you know, phenomenologically, right? And you think of a contemporary uh, phenomenologist like Merleau Ponty or so on, right? The, our, our embodiment is very much essential to our sense of self, right? Our sense of our own identity. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why, for example, in bioethics, people are concerned about things like face transplants and so on. Um, yeah. Right, because we, we so much identify with with, with our faces, um, and so that's that's the where Aquinas sets himself apart from the substance dualist. Of course, Aquinas is a dualist of a sort. Um, hylomorphism is a, a dualistic theory because Aquinas argues that the soul is distinct from the body, um, at least conceptually. Uh, he, he conceives of them. Eleanor Stump describes it like the two metaphysical parts that make up the body. Right. Yeah two parts of a whole and even though our 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 the our rational soul can persist beyond the death of the body um that's an incomplete existence 
um, right, right from right. Plato, death freed the soul from the prison of the body. You are more truly yourself when you're without your body. Mm -hmm. Where as, as when we die and our soul lives on, we are less ourselves. Um, there's even this whole debate about whether you can call the separated soul a person or the same person or not. Right. Clearly, this is why Aquinas, of course, as a Christian, believes in bodily resurrection. Um, you know, he thinks that it's metaphysically necessary for the body to be restored to the soul for us to be complete and whole again. Mm -hmm. um, I guess there, there could be an objection raised at this point, though, um, that if the soul has the potential to be um, an independent, subsisting entity apart from the body, uh, why not just say it's a separate substance? Mm -hmm. um, or, um, yeah, if, if it's just a part of the whole person, um, in what sense can we say that it's, it's identical to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in terms of um, the first point about, you know, why, why not just call the soul a substance, right? Why not just go with substance dualism? Aquinas has a very technical distinction between, um, a, between being a substance which means you're a member of a natural kind. You have an essence. Mm -hmm. You exist completely with that essence. Right. Um, where, so take the essence of, of water, right? H2O. If you only have the two hydrogen molecules and you don't have the oxygen molecule, you don't have water, right? You yeah. have to have everything for the complete substance to be there. Um, and, but he separates that from mere subsistence. And his basic argument is that when the soul is separate from the body, it is a subsistent thing. It exists, but it doesn't have the complete nature of a substance. It doesn't have the complete human nature because it's lacking that other crucial metaphysical part of the body. Right. Um, now, you know, one may ask, why not go the other direction too, right? Um, why not say that the soul just is the body or that we, the, the human beings, are just our bodies, right? What makes hylomorphism distinct from um, a form of materialism. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, we, there's, a, there's a large um, pull towards materialism based on all of our you know, neuroscientific understanding of everything that's happening um, in the brain and the rest of the body, right? Our endocrine system, our hormonal, our hormonal system, and so on that affects our cognition, how we think. But as many philosophers of mine, Thomist and non-Thomist alike, um, argue, uh, there's plenty of arguments against the reduction or identification of our mental states with our neurological states, even if there's a strict correlation or supervenience relation between the two. Mm -hmm. And so as a, as a Thomist, you know, we can use Aquinas' arguments, which we can get into if you want, but we can sure. also rely on, on other arguments from folks like, you know, John Searle or David Chalmers or whoever, um, who again are by no means, well, Chalmers is a property dualist, not a substance dualist. Um, yeah. Searle, again, is a non-reductive materialist. And, and so it, I think the best way, you know, to um, taxonomize Thomistic hylomorphism is, um, um, is the way uh, Eleanor Stump actually does it in a 1995 article from Faith and Philosophy, which was again, very influential on in my thinking. She titled it um, Non-Cartesian Dualism and Materialism Redu Without Reduction. And okay. I think that kind of captures the essence of where hylomorphism lies in the spectrum here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um yeah, so I guess like what, what would be some of the reasons why we'd want to avoid material reduction, like a reduction of the mind to, to matter? Yeah, so we'll start with Aquinas' own arguments and, and see what we think of those. Yeah. Uh, so Aquinas' basic argument is, is this. Um, certainly, if we talk about the mind as a whole, right, there's different functions that the mind can engage in. And some of these functions are completely tied to functions of the brain. They just are neural functioning. Mm -hmm. and, and they're the same types of mental functions that non-human animals can engage in as well. So not, you know, my cat has memory, right? My cat yeah. has imagination. 
um, my cat can sense the world and respond to it. That requires uh, imagination as this internal sense. Not imagination as a, I don't know my cat sitting around daydreaming, um, but we do know that animals dream um, because we see them engaging in behaviors and REM sleep cycles and so on, just like we do. Um, so we have evidence that there's some, you know, some cognitive imagery going on that's not simply uh, sensory processing. Um, and animals can, uh, you know, can arguably, at least some of the higher animals, reason to a certain extent, in, in a sense of being yeah. you know, kind of calculated means end type reasoning. So all that, all that stuff that, that animals can do, of course we can do, but the, the argument is that the, the thing that the rational animal can do, and of course whether all and only humans count as rational animals is a big open question, so we, we maybe can get into. <laughs> yeah. But what, what a rational animal can do that a non-rational animal can't is engage in abstract conceptual thought, right? We can engage in thinking about universal concepts. So again, my cat can differentiate me from you know, my wife or the two of us from a stranger, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we see evidence of that behaviorally, right? Or maybe yeah. it's better seen with, with, with dogs, right? Dogs, you know, go to get pet by their owners and they bark at strangers, right? Yeah. What it doesn't seem that a dog can do um, is um, to, to categorize, um, you know, these different entities and say, oh, they're the same kind of thing. They're human and they're different right. from me. I'm a dog, right? It's that type of conceptual universal thinking. Mm -hmm. and, and so the point is that since universals do not exist in, they exist, they're, they're instantiated material things, right? Humanity yeah. is within each of us, but humanity itself is just a concept, right? right. There, there's no one thing you can point to and say, that's humanity. Um, and so the point being then is that if these concepts that we're capable of receiving and, and processing and, and maintain storing, uh, in, in, in our minds are themselves immaterial, then whatever grafts them and holds them and thinks about them must itself be immaterial. Uh, so that's, that's the main reason why, even if there are neural things happening when we're engaging in this type of conceptual thought, um, it's a correlation uh, of, of, of activity, but we can't reduce the one to the other. Right. Um, now that sort of depends on certain presuppositions uh, about the nature of universals, correct? Um, like if, if I were to argue that our universal reasoning is just a, a complex form of pattern recognition, like if, if I were say a nominalist, would I run into the same um, issues and commit myself to the same uh, metaphysical baggage of, of saying that you know, the intellect must be this immaterial entity in order to contain these universal concepts? No, you're exactly right. Aquinas' argument that depends on this broader metaphysics of universals. And so, yeah, if you undercut the one, it undercuts uh, the other. But, it's not, but that's not the only reason, right, to think of the, the intellect as, as immaterial. Mm -hmm. uh, another key aspect of it is self-awareness. Right. Uh, the ability of the mind to turn back on itself. Um, you know, thought, thought thinking its own, thought thinking of itself. And... Okay. and it, honestly, that, I mean, that really gets to, I think, the, the true hard problem of consciousness, to use a term from David Chalmers. Chalmers thinks that all consciousness presents a, quote, hard problem, which is what leads him to the property dualism, um, even just about sensory qualia, right, qualitative phenomenal experiences of just, you know, seeing an object, um, which animals also have, so that animals would also have immaterial properties in their consciousness. Um, yeah. You know, I'm not saying whether that view is right or wrong, but that's definitely not the Thomistic view. Right. Um, but the point is that, that if, if, if mere consciousness presents a hard problem, I think self-consciousness presents an even harder problem. And so even if the former could arguably be ultimately explanatorily uh, reducible to neurological functioning, um, I think it's, it's a much harder hill to climb to argue that self-awareness uh, can be neurobiologically reduced. Okay, well, why is that? Um, to, to be honest, I, I don't, so one of the things I, I don't do in this book, unfortunately, because you know, you're limited to a certain amount of space, 
And yeah. I actually don't do a lot of philosophy of mind in this book. Um, mm. I, I re- wrote a section um, on the chapter on dualism, uh, but then the publisher's like, you need to cut like 20,000 words out. And so I'm like, okay. Right. okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, that's, that's, that, that's a cop out answer to say that, yeah, I don't have, I don't have uh, a, the knockdown argument. I'm, I'm very much reliant on, I mean, I think people like Searle and Chalmers, um, Lynn Baker, um, who I do t- talk a lot about in the book, um, she has this constitutional theory of person which is a form of non-reductive materialism. Uh, so she thinks that ultimately matter can at least account for, um, for this phenomenon. But for her, um, having a robust first person perspective is what makes one a person. And right. I think that very much aligns with Aquinas's view um, that again, self-conscious, self-awareness, be it the capacity to think I thoughts. Um, and, and here's the thing. If, all of this is ultimately explanatorily reducible to the neurological, then, you know, there is no, there is no basis then for arguing that the rational soul can continue to persist beyond the death of the body. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, just um, there, there's a argument that's often made um, that my, my own self-consciousness, like my, my conscious thoughts, my conscious experience is something that's transparent to me. Um, but neurological data, like about, you know, C fibers firing, the relationship between certain neurons um, is uh, irreducibly third person. It doesn't uh, talk about the, um, the what it's like, the, the qual- qualitative aspect of, of experience. Is that, is that sort of your uh, argument, something a Thomist would accept? Uh, I think it, it can be acceptable to a Thomist. Um, like I said, that, that's very much, very close to, you know, Chalmers argument for property dualism. Yeah. Um, and, and of course for property dualism, there's, there's no, it doesn't require postulating a thing that's thinking that is a self immaterial, right? It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's human in that way. Um, there are just these, things, these qualia, right, these qualitative mental states, um, that these properties themselves are explanatorily irreducible. And one of the huge problems that, that Ch- at least Chalmers' form of property dualism has to deal with is whether these, these mental properties have any causal relation, right? Or are they uh, what's referred to as epiphenomenal, right? Yeah. They're, they're these kind of byproduct of neurological functioning generates these these things, these mental states, but the mental states themselves don't do anything, right? They don't impact, which has a huge, you know, part of what makes that problematic is when we think about something like the will, right? This is another huge element for, of, of, of the intellect for Aquinas, is that we have a will that's capable of, again, conceptually analyzing various goods that we might be able to pursue at a given moment and making a free choice to pursue one good over another. Um, and so that too is um, constitutive of the, the immaterial aspect of, of the human soul. Mm-hmm. It, it sort of requires you to take a step back from your immediate sense experience and any sort of desire produced by that <clears throat> in order to um, like rationally assess which is the best path forward. Mm-hmm. And so it could be the case that say again, something like Chalmers property dualism does yield um, you know, yield the existence of these irreducible qualitative mental states that, again, not only humans, but other animals, right? Anything that has, uh, I mean, Chalmers talks about thermometers <laughs> being yeah. conscious in this way, right? Any information bearing thing, right? That, that's his criterion. Um, which, you know, whether we go that far or not, but the point being is that, you know, animal consciousness could have immaterial aspects in the sense of these properties, but that doesn't necessarily entail, especially if these properties are epiphenomenal, that there's, um, there's an activity, a function that they're engaging in um, that is itself immaterial, right? It's the, if we go back to Aristotle, right? It's the ergon, it's the, it's the activity, um, um, sorry, not ergon, the, the energeia, Right, it's this, it's this activity of doing something, which is what makes the the 
you get not just properties of the rational soul, but the rational soul itself to be immaterial. Mm -hmm. And so I think that Thomas could accept, say, you know, property dualism for animal consciousness and some aspects of human consciousness, but that there's still this higher level, higher order thinking that humans or again, maybe not just humans, but rational animals can do um, that yields this immaterial subsistent part of us. Okay. But it, I don't believe that's the typical Thomistic view. And it's more typical to just say that, um, say your perception of things, um, your uh, like the qualitative aspect of subjective experience of say, you know, what is it, what is it like to be a bat? What is it like to experience the color red? Uh, th those are material processes and they can be reduced to that. But sort of the definition of redness or batness, that's sort of when we step out of the material. Mm -hmm. Is that a correct assessment? Yeah, no, I, 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 I would agree that that's kind of a st the standard reading. And so there's a sharp bifurcation between yeah, non-rational mental, mental states, which are physically reducible, and not and rational mental states which aren't um but but yeah i mean i think a, a thomas i think a thomas can remain agnostic on that question right i don't think yeah thomas polymorphism drives you to either affirm or deny some form of again property dualism or some other non-reductive um theory of the mind yeah okay um well i i don't want to spend too much time on the philosophy of mind um, but I guess that this sort of discussion does raise some metaphysical questions. Uh, and so, you know, one question is, um, well, if, if consciousness, or at least intellectual consciousness can't be accounted for by material processes, um, like if, if we were to try and construct like a, a, a scientific history of the world, we would have to posit uh, consciousness um, we'd have to posit an outside cause, like a non-material cause for consciousness. Uh, I know people like Nagel have suggested um, maybe expanding our, our view of evolutionary history to include immaterial causes. But Aquinas sort of famously says that, uh, no, the soul is directly created by God. And I just wonder why we should, you know, I think you favor Aquinas's explanation, do you? Um, to be honest, I'm personally a, a agnostic on that particular question. Um, okay. in, in the book, I, I, you know, I kind of, I talk about Aquinas' view um, and give his, his reasons for it. Basically, you know, no, just as no material process can generate uh, an immaterial thing like thought, if that logic holds, then the same logic says an a material process can't create the immaterial subject of thought, right? The, mm. the, the, the intellect, the rational soul. Um, and, and, and but I don't know if those, if, that, if those two rationales necessarily have to go together. In, in other words, there could be an argument that material processes generate um, an immaterial subject of thought. And it has to be an immaterial subject of thought because thoughts themselves are immaterial. Um, and, and so, like I said, this, 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 you have to, it does tie into the, you know, the wider ontology of things like of thoughts concepts uh universals and so mm -hmm. on um but is it you know i guess the, the, so the question comes is it theoretically possible is it metaphysically possible for a material evolutionary process um to develop uh an intellective mind um and, and again aquinas's rationale is, is no so the idea is that um, and of course, Aquinas is writing, you know, pre-Darwin, but the basic mm. idea is that, you know, Dar you know, the evolution of the human body, the human form uh, continues. And it, the key is that when it reaches a point where you start having um, beings born uh, with this intrinsic potential to develop a brain that would then support, you know, the the receiving and processing of complex sensory information, um, creating these, the object uh, that can now be thought about intellectually. Mm -hmm. And that's the moment that when God now intervenes in, in, the, the, in human evolution and infuses the, the rational soul into these types of creatures. Okay. Um, 
and and so the the sort of creation of the intellect is sort of a like a a, a supernatural interference in the, the history of, of a material process and it's sort of repeated um with each like each and every new human life yeah it on that view it would be i mean it has to be you know okay. something that's an individual act each time um which is not to say i mean people like to say every baby is a miracle of course when you're holding a newborn baby it, it, yeah. it feels miraculous mm -hmm. um but it's not miraculous in the sense that you know i think this is very much a product of the way god as aquinas conceives of god um as among other things um uh, a being that rationally orders a universe, right? God the, did not create a chaotic universe. God created an ordered universe. And of course, God could have set up the universe such that kind of a deistic notion of God, right? God sets it all up. God sets it in motion and then just watches everything unfold, right? Mm. Um, and, um, and maybe intervenes once in a while in some miraculous right, fashion. But another way of conceiving, well, so that's one view. Yeah. The, the exact opposite view, and then we'll put Aquinas in the middle, is um, uh, Nic uh, Nicolas Malebranche, a uh, contemporary Descartes, had this theory of what he called occasionalism. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is that absolutely nothing happens without God doing it. Right? Yeah. God Every is not only change is a miracle. Exactly. Um, and so Aquinas' view is in the middle, where there is a rationally ordered universe. Things are, so as the Dia says, kind of set up to move on their own uh, with God always as the first cause ultimately. Mm -hmm. but, but part of the divine intervention uh, we can call it in terms of creating the rational soul is itself part of that natural order of the universe. Like in other words, God has ordered the universe because God wills to create rational beings. Mm -hmm. God wills, uh, to to do this regular intervention. Um, so for example, God being omnipotent um, could put a rational soul into my cell phone. Yeah. Like God could turn this into a person right now if God wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, that's not, that's not playing by the rules that God set up, right? And if God is omniscient as well as omnipotent, um, then the, the ordered rules that God set up for the universe are, this, are rules that God is going to play by um, uh, himself, unless there's some sort of extreme need, say, you know, due to the existencies of human sin or so on, that God is, okay, now I got to become incarnate and do all these, these things, right? Mm -hmm. the thing is then, what this opens the door up, and this ties into bioethics, is the idea that um, anytime matter is properly organized to generate a mind that's sufficiently sophisticated, a brain, excuse me, that's sufficiently sophisticated to create the appropriate mental objects for, for intellective thought that God's going to intervene and create a rational soul in that being. So, you know, when, when cloning was, you know, I mean, people talk about clones before this, but definitely 1997 after Dolly, the, the first mammal was cloned, the sheep, yeah. right? And human cloning was, was something everyone was concerned about. One of the questions that would come up is, well, would, would a human clone have a soul? And yeah. I would say, yeah, you know, because even if it's a, a by an artificial scientific engineered process, even if it's a process that we might think is immoral, um, you know, if the, if there's an appropriate product of not conception, but what's called somatic cell nuclear transfer, um, God is going to, to again play by the rules that that God God Himself has set up. Um, Aquinas even talks about this, not about cloning, but he talks about. Um, you know, children conceived, say, in, in rape or in fornication, right? Uh, yeah. Children conceived in sin, right? The act by which they were, they were conceived is wrong. But once a, that being is there, God is going to, you know, again, cooperate and infuse a rational soul. Yeah. Um, why couldn't uh, rational souls, like, generate or be the cause of more rational souls? Why does it need to be uh, divine like a divine intervention. I think that maybe, um, you know, the instance of cloning where there's not necessarily like other human souls involved in a natural act of generation might be a bit of a counterexample. Um, but is it, is it metaphysically impossible for like a, for a soul to create another soul? Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's certainly yeah not the way Aquinas when he taxonomizes the powers of of a rational soul, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. of course. And I know that there's some uh, bias in the theological tradition against that position as well, with traducianism and whatnot. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'm just curious. Like, is it metaphysically impossible? Yeah. Um, I mean, the question would come down to whether yeah, a rational soul has the power to create since it's an immaterial thing. Why, why couldn't it have the power to create another immaterial thing? Mm -hmm. uh, again, the mechanism by which it does it would have to avoid things that involve, say, like, again, you can't divide the soul into parts, so you can't, like, take a piece of the soul and transmit it or something like that. Yeah. Um, and, of course, we had the problem in, in sexual generation where we would have, you know, the souls of two different people Kind of fusing to create this new soul right yeah so i think that that becomes becomes problematic um you know aquinas's take on this is it, and of course he had a you know medieval conception of biology but at least there's some aspects that we could translate into contemporary terms so he talks about um uh, he talked it talks about um the male semen having this formative power right yeah. so it's 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 not an extension of of the of the father's rational soul but again it's this this formative power to take the matter that the woman provides and form it into an, an, an a fetus right mm -hmm. and you can kind of think of this formative power something akin to like dna which again is not just contributed from one parent but from both parents right? yeah right um so that's an extension of their bodies right that's an extension of their ensouled nature um but as a part of the rational rationally in soul nature um, considering that that biological reproduction is something that you know other animals and plants and you know things do um, um, that that the reproductive power seems to be you know constitutive of that, those vegetative aspects of our soul the purely material aspects yeah. um, so I, I think my, my ultimate answer to your question is I don't see uh, a metaphysical impossibility um, but I think there are some metaphysical problems with it. Okay. Yeah. It certainly complicates explanation. Um, I, I was just curious about your opinion on that particular question. Um, but like, I guess so far, uh, we've really been talking about like the soul in, in abstraction from the body. Um, but maybe we could just talk a, a little bit about how, um, like the soul and the body relate to, um, like continued personal identity. Like, why do we need the soul in order to secure a continued personal identity? Um, what happens if we say, you know, is it is it uh, possible for us to change bodies, like for a soul to become the soul of another body? Um, and how do we deal with those sort of the relationship between the two? Mm -hmm. So certainly for a, a substance dualist, um, there's no reason that just as I can you know, drive one car today and drive a different car tomorrow that, right, my soul might become causally related to um, a different body at different times. Mm -hmm. um, and, and on that view, then, you know, uh, from the, the Christian notion of bodily resurrection is not so much that my body is resurrected, is that God provides me with some new body, uh, this glorified body that now me, as a pure soul, now causally interacts with, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, again, if Plato's right, that our, our, our most true and free nature is as a soul, then it seems like resurrection is something that wouldn't be desirable, right? It's just imprisoning us in some other body, right? Mm -hmm. um, but again, with the body being glorified, maybe then that's okay, right? Our body's still going to cooperate right, with us. Um, it's going to be a Lamborghini as opposed to a Ford Pinto, right? Right. <laughs> um, but... But for, so, so personal identity, right, on that view is just the identity of my soul. Mm -hmm. And, and this, then speak to the other side, right, if one is a, a, an animalist, say like Eric Olson, who I referred to before, representing a form of uh, reductive materialism, then for Olson, my personal identity consists in the persistent identity of this animal body, yeah. like this particular body. And and, and of course, my body changes parts through time where I'm constantly losing cells and generating new cells and 
um, you know, swapping out different parts of my body. Um, but there's a, there's a continuity where even you, know, you go back to Locke, Locke talks about the continuity of the animal body, right? Uh, you know, he types of ship of Theseus problems, right? As long as the change is slow enough, enough of the original parts persist uh, as the changeover happens, you have this continued identity, even though you have this flux of micro level constituents. And Aquinas kind of sees things right the same way. Um, but then one of the, the pushbacks against Olson's argument is, you know, uh, you think of things like uh, cerebral transplant thought experiments and things of that nature, all those puzzles that Derek Parfit brings up in part three of his famous book, Reasons and Persons, um, mm -hmm. and that others have brought up as well. And the, there, there's what's referred to as the transplant intuition, right? This very strong metaphysical intuition um, that one goes wherever, wherever the thinking aspect of one goes, right? So if the soul is what thinks, that's where we go. If the brain is what thinks, that's where we go, where the brain goes. And, and so my take as a, a interpreting Aquinas is, is agreement with the transplant intuition, um, but without, again, postulating substance dualism um, and without postulating um, that we are reducible, say, to just our brains, right? Yeah. Um, so my persistent identity, just to sum up the, the basic answer to the question, if we, we can talk about some of these puzzles if you want, um, the basic answer to the question is, for Aquinas, like the dualist, I do go where my soul goes, but not just because my soul is the seat of you know, my, my, my mental activity, my self-awareness, but it's also the form of my body. Mm -hmm. So that any matter informed by my soul, by definition, is my body. Yeah. And, and, and I often use the, the, the analogy. It's a, it's, it's a, it's, I think it's a pretty good analogy. There's, there's some in maybe disanalogous features, but thinking of the soul as uh, the blueprint of the body. Mm -hmm. right? Because the soul is not the efficient cause of the body. My soul doesn't have the agency to make my body exist. Yeah. But it's the formal cause of my body. It is the blueprint once, once, the, once the house is built, right? It is the blueprint put into concrete form um, yeah. with the matter, right? And so any matter that follows that blueprint is my body. Uh, but what's interesting about this is, again, just as we change all the micro level constituents of our bodies throughout our lives, yet as long as the same form persists, the same body persists, even the radical change of death and resurrection, um, you would have, so, so resurrection requires divine intervention, right? Again, my, it's not that my soul brings my body back together because that yeah. would make an efficient cause, right? God's the efficient cause. But we still want my resurrected body to be my body, right? But, but here's the funny thing, the, the, you know, whatever physicists tell us are the ultimate micro level constituents of our bodies, whatever our bodies break down into, right, over time after we die, the, those constituents of my resurrected body don't need to be the same as the constituents of my body right now or my body at the moment of my death. Um, they could be, I could be completely made out of everything that's makes, making up your body right now. But that right. wouldn't mean that I would look like you. Yeah. I would still look like me. Right? It'd still be my body, mm -hmm. and vice versa. It could, you know, again, it could be the matter making up, you know, this book could be become constituents of my body. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it sounds though like um, like material continuity is not that important to personal identity. Um, and so, like, if if there were to be something dramatic, I mean, you use the example of um, of a head transplant. Um, but just like with, yeah, like with, with something like that, how would my identity, my identity persist? Or I think there's, um, there's a thought experiment about where the two hemispheres of my brain are taken out and each hemisphere is implanted into a different body. And in that case, there's not really, uh, any sort of material continuity. Uh, there's sort of like, you know, three products like, yeah, that, that sort of came about from from the parts of my body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, 
I'll, I'll let me talk about the head transplant case first because yeah. that's a simpler case. And then, yeah, we can talk about the cerebral hemispherectomy. Um, so in the head transplant case, which of course is, you know, is a thought experiment initially, but there are actually a couple neurosurgeons, um, an Italian neurosurgeon uh, named Sergio Canaverdo and um, a, um, a Chinese neurosurgeon named uh, Xi Ping Ren. And mm -hmm. they have been collaborating uh, for several years and doing animal experiments and so on. And they claim that they have uh, develop a technique um, going by the, the acronym HEAVEN, because uh, I think this is a pathway to immortality. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, uh, um, it, it stands for like HEADS Venture Anastomosis. I can't remember the exact what it means off the top of my head. But, <laughs> okay. Um, but anyways, but, but they are actually looking for a human volunteer uh, to do the world's first head transplant. Yeah, I, I've heard about this. <laughs> Yeah, he actually did have a volunteer, um, a Russian quadriplegic man, but he, he backed out when he, he lost confidence that they really had perfected this technique. But yeah. <laughs> um, but anyways, so I've written a little bit about this thought experiment. I actually have an art, a full length article coming out on it probably next year in Journal of Medicine and Philosophy. Okay. And you know, so from a Thomistic perspective, I think it's uh, fairly clear that, again, at this moment, I am my entire body, right? Aquinas says our, our soul being immaterial is not, you know, exist. In one sense, it doesn't exist anywhere. On the other hand, though, through its powers, it exists everywhere that the powers of my body are manifest. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, um, my soul is as much in my pinky toe as it is in my brain. Yeah. Right? Um, but the powers of, say, sight are only happening through my eyes and optic nerve and occipital lobe, um, whereas my power of locomotion is happening through my legs, right, and my motor cortex and spinal cord. Um, but the point being is that, yeah, my soul is, is informing this entire organism. So then what happens if, if say, you cut off my hand, right, Luke Skywalker style? Um, well, that hand, once severed from my body, once no longer functionally or structurally integrated with my body, is no longer my hand, properly speaking. Right? I might look at right. it lying, laying there on the ground and saying, oh, that, that's my hand. Yeah. Oop. Sorry about that. Knocked off my... Uh, that, that's okay. And say, that's my hand. Uh, but it isn't, technically speaking, my hand. Right? Um, and so what happens if you chop off my legs? Same thing. You chop off my legs and my arms, right? So you get to the point where you've chopped off everything. And so it's not so much, thinking, if you think of it as removing my head, that's one thing. I like to think of it as removing the rest of my body. And we're just reducing me to my head. Right. And so assuming that this can be successfully done, right? We are not only keeping, you know, the organ, my brain, uh, the cerebrum that, uh, again, supports my my rational thinking it's not it's not where rational thinking occurs but it supports rational thinking um but even the brain stem which is a critical part of my brain for controlling the rest of the of my body the rest of the organism by sending signals through the spinal cord and so if we sever my head and we successfully graft it onto another body and my head becomes again structurally and functionally integrated with the rest of that body. My brainstem starts controlling the vital metabolic functions of that body and everything. Um, the, it would become my body, right? Mm -hmm. um, during the in between stage of the procedure, I would just be my head, right? But that doesn't mean that I don't become then the whole package once the transplant's complete. Um, so, so that's all to say that, you know, I would go with my head in that type of case. Okay. And you would like in the new body, you would remain just your head and the new in, body would sort of be an instrument. In that particular case, I think, um, assuming again, assuming everything's successful, I, my soul would come to inform the whole body. Okay. And, and the reason for this is that, um, when we think about the question, one of the questions I'm very much interested in the bioethics realm is this question of how we de the determine death, 
how do we define the death of a human person? Yeah. And without going into, I mean, we can go into all the different arguments in a yeah. minute if you want to, but the position I advocate is what's referred to as um, whole brain death or mm. total brain failure, which means that not only is the cerebrum irreversibly non-functional, so the, the individual is completely irreversibly comatose, but also the brainstem has ceased to function irreversibly. And again, the brainstem, among other functions, um, controls the mm. diaphragm, which we need for, to breathe. It sends mm. signals to help regulate our heartbeat so our heart doesn't go into arrhythmia. Um, it does all these regulatory functions that are critical to the body. Of course, there's a lot of things the bodies do. You know, like my liver doesn't depend on brain signals for it to do what it does, or my kidneys. Right. Um, and obviously, parts of my body do things that are critical for my brain to keep functioning, right? It's a, it's, it's a holistic you know, feedback loop. But the most critical thing, though, is the brainstem sending the signals to, to control the vital metabolic functions that keep oxygenated blood circulating throughout my body, right? Without that, nothing else is going to work. Mm -hmm. So the point being is that if, if that is the appropriate way to think about death, and there's all sorts of you know, critiques of it, um, then if you have my whole head being transplanted, the moment you remove it from my body, that body's dead. Yeah. Right? It's functionally equivalent to whole brain death. The body that my head's being transplanted to, it's also had its head removed, right? Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe it had already suffered whole brain death, but the rest of the body's still alive, right? We, we got hooked up to a mechanical ventilator, right? To, we get, so we're keeping air going into it, but the, the body's not keeping itself alive. But once right. we graft my head onto it and my brainstem, takes control and gets the diaphragm going and so on, then we can unplug the ventilator and voila, I'm, I'm there as a whole. Okay. All right. Uh, before we get uh, too much into, uh, well, uh, yeah, first I wanted to ask you about the sort of um, the severing of the brain in two and transplanting oh, it yeah. into two different bodies. Uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. How, how would that work? Yeah. Um, so again, th this is a thought experiment that many philosophers have talked about. Again, probably most famously Derek Parfit. And uh, Parfit uses this to argue that personal identity, and, and this is a key word, identity, because when we think about identity, right, it's a one-one relation. Mm -hmm. A thing can only be identical to itself, right? Um, it can't be identical to two different things. And so if if part of if, if, if what makes me me and so, and so this is premised on a, on a psychological theory of personal identity right uh, again this transplant intuition that wherever my psychology wherever the thing that houses or supports my psychology goes that's where i go yeah and so again if we transplanted my entire cerebrum seems like i just go with that cerebrum but if we are dividing the cerebrum which we know can happen um, and each half house, maybe not perfectly because there's some aspects of my psychology that I'll lose, but enough of my same psychology that each of those hemispheres alone, we can say suffices to be me or constitute me. Then yeah, if we divide them up and transplant them to two different crania, two different other bodies, mm -hmm. um, then both of those, those persons, when they wake up from the procedure, will think that they're me. Yeah. Right. Both of them will look at the body laying behind and say, oh, that was me. But now here I am. But then they'll look at each other and say, but who are you, imposter? <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and so Parfit uses this to say, because the two can't be identical to the one, right, the original, because you can't split identity in that way. Mm -hmm. Then Parfit says, look, identity is not really what matters to us because these two persons are not identical to the original but it seems like if i were the original i would consider myself to have survived in both of these other two persons yeah um and and if people want an illustration of this right this seems too too science fiction of course i'm this is not getting science fiction reference but um there's a wonderful um episode of star trek the next generation a huge trekker yeah um, where uh, Commander Riker is split by the transporter beam into two people. 
Mm -hmm. right? So you have two Rikers and they're clearly two distinct individuals, but they also both clearly seem to have come from the same individual. So how does Thomas handle this? Um, so in brief, um, this, is, this is what the Thomas has to bite the bullet on. Um, to the, you know, there's metaphysical um, determinacy and um, epistemic determinacy. Metaphysically, um, I go wherever my soul goes. Okay. And since the soul is not something that, again, itself has parts, which can be split up, right? You can't split my soul needs, again, going to two other people. Then either one of two things has happened. Either A, I died when my cerebrum was split. Yep. And these two other people are imposters, right? They, they have my memories. Mm -hmm. They even have my first person awareness. Uh, but neither of them are actually me. Or one of them's me and the other's not. Okay. And the issue is, is that we have no good epistemic criterion to distinguish in that latter, in that, in that latter case, which of them is me. Right. Um, and that's, so is, is that a coherent view to hold? I would argue yes, because I think we can coherently say that there's, we have a meta, we have a determinate metaphysical criterion. Where does the soul go? That's yeah. the criterion. But we don't have a, but what we lack is a determinate epistemic criterion to determine where did the soul say go. Say which one it is. Okay. So I would say that we should treat both of the survivors as me. Okay. Either neither of them, them are me or only one of them is me. Right. Okay. That's pretty interesting. But it, it also sort of suggests, uh, like a, a lot of theories of continued personal identity um, sort of rely on um, my own self-consciousness, my memories, uh, my ability to say, yes, I was the same person when I was eight, and I share the same subjectivity uh, of that person as I do now and as I will when I'm 60. Um, but I, I guess this experiment sort of suggests that uh, like sort of subjective continuity is, is not a sufficient ground for um, continued personal continuity. Yeah, I mean, th this is where it really gets problematic because again, with both of them, you know, going back to my earlier point that self-awareness is one of those activities that the rational soul engages in, you know, that makes it in this immaterial thing, right? And so that seems to imply that we're, that anything that has my subjective self-awareness is me, mm -hmm. right? And um, like I said, I, you know, Lynn Baker, who I discuss in the book, there's, like I said, she talks about this notion of the first robust first person perspective. And so personal identity in her view, because uh, she's a materialist, so she doesn't think there's anything like a soul, is just continuity of that same first person perspective. And um, I, I haven't, I didn't read, uh, she, she passed away a few years ago and her last book was specifically on the first person perspective. And I haven't read it yet because it came out after I was already pretty much done working on this book. Um, right. And so I'm curious in there, if she talks about the cerebral transplant experiment because, because both resultants would have the same first person perspective, although only one of them can again be strictly identical to the original. Um, and it would seem that what she has to say is that, yeah, one, it's an apparent continuity of the first person perspective and one is an actual continuity of the first person perspective. Um, but that even the subject, you know, him or herself wouldn't have, again, have an appropriate epistemic criterion to distinguish. Um, which is which. So one of them thinks they're the original and they are, and one of them thinks they're the original and they're not. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, yeah, talk, talk about the, the hard problems, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I guess the way that we um, like define what a human person is and how to parse out like personal identity, um, it really factors into a lot of bioethical issues. And I, I'm thinking in particular, um, just with our, our previous discussion of like end of life issues. So um, I, I've heard it said 
before it as well. Like, um, you know, people will say uh, someone who's, who's in their old age, perhaps they're suffering from memory loss, uh, that they're, they're just not the same person anymore. Mm -hmm. And that sort of raises, um, you know, certain ethical questions about the way that you relate to them and view them as a member of the family and, you know, potential like other, other healthcare issues. And so like, I, I know that the Thomas theory of the soul, um, like it does more work than just, you know, uh, yeah, the Thomistic theory of the soul is meant to explain more than just personal consciousness, sensate consciousness, but it's also just meant to explain life in general. Um, so perhaps we could get into the relationship, like how, how would a Thomas differ in the way they define life and death versus a materialist or a dualist? And how, how does that sort of relate to end of life issues? Yeah, no, great question. Um, like I said, this is one of the early questions that really got me excited about, you know, the bioethical realm. And once I saw that there was all these debates about brain death and, and then of course in uh, 2005, we had the famous case of Terry Schiavo, yeah. uh, who's in a persistent vegetative state. And again, there's the ethical question of whether tube feeding should continue or not. And that's an important question in itself and the question I've written on. Um, but again, as a metaphysician, I'm more interested in the question of, is she still a person? Is that still Terry, right? Yeah. So yeah, if, if one has, um, again, a dualist or this, um, this psychologically based um, theory of personal identity that goes back to like John Locke, um, and again, renewed by people like Derek Parfit and so on, um, if one has that theory of personhood, then certainly someone like Terry Schiavo, uh, who is irreversibly um, uh, unconscious, irreversibly unaware, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's a, like a persistent vegetative state. Yeah, persistent vegetative state. Um, and which is different, say, from being in a coma, because right. a coma can be reversible, right? We've all seen soap operas, right? Where it's a person's in a coma for three years and they come out, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, usually comas are a little bit shorter than that. Um, but yeah, the, the, the etiology is different usually between coma and, um, and, and PVS, I'll use the shorthand. Um, coma, I mean, there could be multiple causes, but one common cause of, of a coma is some sort of uh, traumatic damage or lesion that forms on the brainstem. Because the brainstem, in addition to the other functions I mentioned earlier, is also um, it has this portion of it called the ascending reticular activating system, which is this cluster of neurons, which is basically the on-off switch for wakefulness. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, a, a classically comatose person, again, the kind we think of in like soap operas, um, they are usually like eyes closed, like they're it's like they're asleep, right? Yeah, and that's because the damage is to the brainstem. And the brain can't repair itself by like growing new neurons or new tissue. This is why Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are devastating irreversible diseases. Mm -hmm. But what the brain can do, especially in younger people, is rewire itself. It can find new pathways to, right. to basically bypass the damage portion and turn that switch back on. Mm -hmm. And then pe that's when people wake up from coma, right? Um, PVS is different because there the damage is to the cerebrum. Right. right? To, to those actual higher portions of, of the brain that are, again, supportive of rational thought. Okay. And, and so once irreversible damage has happened there, um, depending on the extent of the damage, sometimes it is reversible. Um, there's a great book I'd recommend by a neurologist named Joseph Finns um, called Rights Come to Mind. And Finns is part of a, a medical team that, um, in the early 2000s, um, created a new category, a new di diagnostic category called the minimally conscious state. Okay. And the idea is that there were some patients who were initially diagnosed as PVS, but if they were supported and, and, and you know, certain forms of therapy were done with them over a period of weeks, maybe months, maybe even years, they can move from PVS into MCS where there's now detectable consciousness there. They're capable of, of eventually sometimes even communicating and then sometimes mm -hmm. further even moving. Um, and, and, you, and it's not like these are like dramatic recoveries. I mean, there, there have been, 
at least a couple of cases can start where the person literally is up walking and talking after years. Right. Yeah. Um, but in a lot of cases, they're still bedridden, still maybe only able to communicate by like blinking their eyes or moving their head slightly. Right. So it's not like an overly dramatic recovery, but their consciousness comes back. Right. That's the key. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about these PVS cases, I always put the caveat properly diagnosed PVS. <laughs> right. right? Um, and, and so the, so to go back to the question, right, if one has a psychological theory of personhood and personal identity, then a properly diagnosed PVS patient is no longer a person. Mm. And someone who's experiencing like, you know, Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia, on some of these theories, personhood arguably comes in degrees. You can become yeah. less and less of a person. You're still minimally a person, but you're less the same person than you used to be. Mm-hmm. Um, for a Thomist um, and, and other and non Thomists as well, um, view personhood and identity as, um, um, as you have it or you don't have it, right? Yeah. It doesn't come in degrees. Uh, it's all or nothing. That was a, my brain was searching for that phrase. It's all or nothing. Mm-hmm. So the idea would say, well, like someone with severe dementia um, or severe other forms of cognitive disability, they are still, as long as there's some minimal degree of self-awareness, minimal degree of conceptual thought, right? They, they are clearly still a, a person. They're still functioning as a rational animal. Right. Even functioning as well as someone lacking, you know, their, the condition that they, that they have, right? Mm-hmm. But here's the thing, even if they totally lack it, even if they are, say, in PBS, like Terry Schiavo, um, as you noted, right, the soul for a, hylo, for a hylomorphist is not just the, the thing that thinks, it is also the form of the body and therefore all the other powers of the body are sensory powers, are vegetative powers. Right? Mm-hmm. Matter itself is inert, right? Matter yeah. itself does nothing. All matter is informed, right? And the form of the human body is the rational soul. So even mm-hmm. if the body is only functioning vegetatively, but is continuing to function vegetatively, then the soul is still there. It's not mm-hmm. able to actualize its rational powers but it still has its rational powers. Um, they're just latent right now. Yeah. Okay. So it, like Terry Schiavo is, is still a person, still the same person that she was before. Um, I forget exactly what happened. She had an eating disorder. And yeah, she, she suffered from anorexia nervosa. And the theory is that it's not 100% certain, but the theory is that her anorexia led to her um, having a heart attack. Right. And, um, and this was in 1990, I think she was 24 or something when she had the heart attack. Mm-hmm. And then she was in this PBS for 15 years. It was 2005 when they finally removed uh, medically provided nutrition, hydration. She died about eight days later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in, in these cases, um, like it's, it's clearly still a person, still the same person. Um, and I, I think you and I both would argue that persons have like an irreducible form of dignity, um, no matter what their state of life is. So how eth- ethically, how do you deal with these sorts of, of situations? Yeah, so the Terry Schiavo case, I never wrote a paper where I specifically talk about that case, yeah. partly because I'm reticent, A, because I'm not a clinician, mm-hmm. and B, not a clinician who's directly involved in her care. So I always think we have to be a little bit circumspect about writing about cases we only know through media reports, right? Yeah, of course. Or or various one-sided books and articles that people write. But thinking of, again, a patient like Tara Schiavo, uh, I I wrote two different articles um, related to that that type of case. So yeah, in one, I basically just made the argument that we just made. Uh, It's pretty much the argument I make in uh, chapter uh, seven of my book, um, but part of that chapter that but yeah, as you just said, the a patient in PVS, they are still the same person, just in a debilitated state, and they will remain that same person, you know, until they their body ceases to exist as a living organism, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's when death ensues. But as I said earlier, the metaphysics informs, but doesn't necessarily dictate the ethics. Yeah. So, you know, we have to establish whether she's a person or not. I think we, we need to do that. Right. 
And, and one then might argue that because she's a person, as you said, persons have an irreducible dignity. Obviously, you know, from a Thomas perspective, definitely, right? Mm -hmm. Life itself is a fundamental good. Even if we're unable to engage in other goods like sensation or thought, just being alive is itself a, a fundamental good on a Thomistic uh, natural law perspective. Mm -hmm. Does that necessarily mean, though, that we need to take every measure that our technology allows us to do to maintain the life of this, of this living person. And, and this is where there's tremendous debate among, you know, Thomistic bioethicists, Catholic bioethicists, other bioethicists more broadly. Yeah. About whether in this particular type of case, medically provided nutrition and hydration um, should be considered what's sometimes referred to as ordinary care which means it's, it's morally obligatory. Um, mm -hmm. Just as you like, just as you would give a conscious patient in a hospital a tray of food and you wouldn't withhold food from them, um, even though it's being done through a tube in her stomach, we still need to provide you know, a person like Terry with food and water. Mm -hmm. Or should this treatment, because it is a treatment, because it's medically provided, because uh, it's artificial, um, should it be considered extraordinary treatment, meaning it's now morally optional. We, we can provide it, but we may also have good ethical reasons to, with, to withdraw it and allow her body to die. Mm -hmm. And so in this other article I wrote, um, picking up an argument from actually my predecessor, my current position, uh, not my immediate predecessor, but the founder of our bioethics center here at, at St. Louis University, Father Kevin O'Rourke, um, that uh, removing the feeding tube from a patient like Terry is morally permissible. Um, now that doesn't mean that you have to remove the feeding tube. I actually think in, in the particular case of Terry Schiavo, it probably would have been better to have kept the feeding tube, to, to, to have kept her alive. Um, not because there was any hope of recovery, but because she did have loving parents who cared for her, her siblings, yeah. Um, kind of more for their benefit, basically. Um, but, but that's not to say that, you know, if someone doesn't have someone who wants to care for them, yank the tube. <laughs> um, yeah. That's not what I'm implying. But, but the point is, is, is when I looked at this from a Thomistic perspective, you know, we think about burdens versus benefits, right? And again, mm -hmm. life is a fundamental benefit. Life is a fundamental good. Um, but we do have to weigh that fundamental good compared to other fundamental goods um, that may be occluded um, by the treatment. So with feeding tubes, the feeding tube itself could become burdensome to the patient. Um, feeding tubes, um, they become uh, infiltrated and you have to take them out, put them back in. You can get yeah. them as an incision site, it's a surgical procedure. I mean, obviously she was stable. I mean, she was kept alive for 15 years. You know, she was getting kind of good, good standard care. I don't mm -hmm. think the feeding was very problematic for her. And probably, especially because she was in PVS, right? She's not aware of what's going on. Right. right? So even if her, the, there's an infection, it's not like it's causing her pain, right? There'll be a physiological reaction, but not a conscious reaction. So I think it's very hard to construe the feeding tube in her case as burdensome to her. But in other cases, it could be. But here's another potential burden. Going all the way back to kind of where we started in this conversation, right? Thinking about the relation of, of rational intellective functioning to the functioning of the brain. On, a, on my reading of Aquinas, even though rational intellective functioning is itself immaterial, I think it's clear that in our natural embodied state, there's this correlation of mental and neurological functioning, such that what happens to the brain affects the mind and the abil our ability to think, right? Person mm -hmm. gets drunk and they got you know, alcohol in their system that's gonna affect their capacity to think, right? Um, so in the absence, total absence of cerebral functioning, to me it's evident that there's no natural possibility of conscious intellective thought happening you know in that state whereas if one were, were a substance dualist one could argue well for all we know she's thinking in there right the soul's yeah. in there thinking right um it doesn't matter what's happening to the brain 
but that's not how I read that as a hylomorphist. Mm -hmm. So the point is, is I think there is a burden being placed on, on Terry and other and people in that condition. They're being prevented from entering the postmortem state where now mm -hmm. they actually can think, right? Um, it's a limited form of thought that the separated soul can engage in, but it's still, I would argue, a better mode to be in than the mode of being in PVS. So that's the burden that I think continued feeding to um, is placing on someone like, uh, like, like Terry. Okay. All right. Um, so does it come down to a cost benefit analysis then? Um, like the morality of, uh, you know, of, of um, whether or not to continue feeding somebody who's in a persistent vegetative state. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would be careful with, with the term cost benefit because yeah, again, those are inherently ambiguous terms and sure. it also kind of, kind of spreads out to, well, there's the cost benefit to the patient and then there's also other people and society maybe paying for the care that they're receiving and so on, right? And so we get issues of economics and so on. It's in there. Um, the, the way I think, and, and this is, you know, Aquinas doesn't have a, a well worked out thesis on this. So here I'm turning more towards developments from later Catholic moral theologians that very much informs um, the Catholic perspective on these. Uh, I am Catholic, okay. not all Thomas are Catholic. Um, um, but, uh, but when I look at these things as a bioethicist, um, you know, I, I look at it through a, sometimes a purely Thomistic philosophical lens, but then sometimes you also look at it from a broader theological lens. Okay. So in this case, in, in the Catholic tradition, um, that's where this language of ordinary versus extraordinary care comes from, or mm -hmm. sometimes it's referred to as proportionate versus disproportionate care. Right. And the idea is that, is this treatment that we're providing this patient, are the burdens to the patient of this treatment yeah. proportionate to the expected benefits that this treatment will provide to this patient. Mm -hmm. and that's the primary lens. And so it's, again, it's similar to thinking cost benefit terms. Um, it is kind of a little bit consequentialist because you're thinking, you know, what are the expected consequences here? Um, but it's not like a purely utilitarian kind of you know, morally reductive perspective there. Because again, if we're thinking like purely consequentialist or utilitarian terms, like life is not, usually seen as any sort of basic good mm -hmm. or natural law perspective. There is a good that is being served by these types of treatments, life itself. But again, there are other goods at stake as well. Just right. as, right. Uh, so just as martyrs willingly sacrifice their lives for the sake of witnessing to truth, mm -hmm. right? truth is higher than just life. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you need to discern when, the, when it's the right time and the right situation to die. But mm -hmm. Um, you, you said that, um, I guess you, you talked about sort of the, the intermediate state and, uh, I found what was kind of interesting about your book as you, you, you started off listing and listing a number of, uh, desirable criteria, a metaphysical account of the human person needed to fulfill. And one of the, is it the first one? Um, mm -hmm. the possibility of, uh, soul's persistence after death mm -hmm. and resurrection needed to be factored in to a desirable account of the human person. I, I'm just curious as to uh, why, why you took that approach. Um, does it have to do with um, like your commitment to Catholic bioethics or um, does it just have to do, like is it more of a, um, uh, I, I don't know what to say, like a, the, this is sort of a theory that everyone accepts, uh, our language community believes in this and so it's sort of a, a postmodern attempt to develop a, a metaphysical account. Um, that, that sort of corresponds to what our culture thinks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely in terms of the argument I'm making, more the latter. Of course, yeah, personally as a Catholic, I, I do believe as a matter of faith in the possibility of postmortem existence and resurrection. Um, but I'd be a poor philosopher if I was using that as a premise to then try to show that, oh, this theory is better than that because it works better for me as a Catholic, right? Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and, and not that, I mean, here's the thing, you can do a form of philosophical theology where you just take certain premises as a premise theologically mm -hmm. and then try to give a philosophical grounding for them. I think that's a lot of what Aquinas is actually doing throughout his work, right? Yeah. Uh, using philosophy as the handmaiden of theology, right? That's all yeah. referred to. 
Um, so I'm not saying that's a, that's a bad way to be, but no, I am trying to, in this book, um, you know, in a lot of my writing, particularly in bioethics, my argument is usually here's, here's a Thomistic perspective on this issue, right? So a lot of my articles have titles like a Thomistic appraisal of, a Thomistic perspective on, a Thomistic analysis of, right? Mm -hmm. um, and th with this book though, I'm actually arguing by taking on sort of all comers with all these different theories of personhood and personal identity and so on. I'm basically making the argument that we should think about the, you know, I mean, that the Thomist hylomorphic perspective is the best way to think about these things. Mm -hmm. And so that, that the, all the, the arguments I give in other articles for Thomistic perspective, I'm now sort of, you know, giving the argument here that that's the right perspective. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so the point being is that um, I think it does have to be in the end, an argument that stands on its own, right? It's not just, I'm not just trying to preach to the choir of, of fellow believers, right? Fellow travelers yeah. uh, in the Catholic or broader Christian community. Um, so, so, so the rationale then for that first um, desideratum of uh, allowing for the possibility of postmortem existence, um, first to stress the fact that it, it's simply the possibility, right? I don't okay. think any theories prove it. Um, Cause even on a substance dualist perspective where you know, the soul's natural state is a disembodied immaterial state. I mean, it's perfectly cohesive for, to say that when the body dies, the soul is just annihilated, right? Just yeah. blink out of existence, right? Um, and of course, if one believes in God, then of course God has the power to annihilate a soul at any time, right? Um, so nothing proves postmortem existence. Um, but the, I think a theory is stronger uh, for basically the reasons you mentioned the fact that, you know, this is a widely held belief um, across, you know, both various Eastern, Western, indigenous, um, uh, uh, religious trad and spiritual traditions. Um, there are even, you know, atheist philosophers who have attempted to account for some form of, of immortality. Um, yeah. Even, even in a reductive materialist uh, fashion. Uh, just allowing for your know, resurrection by reassembly of the body, right? Something like mm -hmm. that, uh, without any reference to soul talk. So, so it's not that I think that that in Thomism proves postmortem existence, or but I, but I think that this desideratum that a theory is stronger if it allows for this possibility, or as if it's foreclosing on the possibility. I think that's the the there's a greater burden of argument. I think at that point you have to prove that that postmortem existence is impossible to then strengthen to show them why your theory is a better theory, right? Versus saying here's this theory and because of that postmortem existence is impossible. Well, that's a to me that's a mark against your theory. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah. Um, so I guess um, like with like with the postmortem state, you said that that's more desirable and that um, there would be a more limited kind of thinking. And I'm just curious, what, what does that sort of look like? Mm -hmm. So again, this goes back to that distinction we talked about between, um, again, why Aquinas isn't a substance dualist, right? That there's yeah. a mere subsistence and subsistence as a substance where one instantiates one's entire nature. And again, the soul has powers of related to, to rational thought, to intellection and, and volition, powers related to sentience and consciousness and powers related to you know, our vegetative nutritive life. Mm -hmm. And you know, all the ones you know, in those kind of lower two categories um, that require bodily organs to manifest, they're not gonna be able to be active. A right. disembodied soul can't see. A disembodied yeah. soul doesn't breathe, right? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't move, right? Um, what can it do? Well, it seems like to me, it can basically do three things. Um, it can think about itself. Just, okay. it's just well, here I am. <laughs> um, it, can, it can't gain new intellectual knowledge because again, we do that through sensation mm -hmm. um, and the soul can't sense its environment. Um, whatever environment a disembodied soul exists in. Um, 
but it does have knowledge it's gained from its previous life and it, it and it stores that knowledge aristotle in the De Anima talks about memory sensory memory which is mm. in the brain and intellective memory which again is the immaterial storehouse of all the concepts we've learned yeah so i may not for example as a disembodied soul i wouldn't be able to like think about my wife or my daughter because they're individuals right. right i need my imagination to be able to conjure up their faces yeah but i can think about humanity and I can right. think about womanhood, right? And I can think about things. And I can even, you know, engage in analysis. I can put these different concepts together and do deductive reasoning and so on. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's the most fun thing to do in a disembodied state, I don't know. But um, and then there is a one possible, a third possibility, because of course, again, from a Aquinas' perspective, God's there and, and can be involved in this process. And this is something he picks up from Augustine. Um, God can simply illuminate my intellect with new knowledge. Yeah. So again, I can't naturally draw new knowledge, but I can supernaturally be given new knowledge. Mm -hmm. And po possibly knowledge of like concrete particulars. Uh, yeah, uh, that would be something. So in other words, could God illuminate me to think about my wife and my daughter without my imagining them? Um, yeah. Yeah, that could be possible. Yeah, I, I believe that that is a sort of traditional argument surrounding like the intercession of the saints, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I'm, I'm just curious, um, in, in the sort of disembodied state, um, you know, only being able to, I guess, yeah, the, the soul is the form of a, of a human person, uh, but the, it's only existing as a subsistent part, and it doesn't really have access to any of its sort of personal consciousness, memories, or, or like, memories of its previous life apart from the abstract knowledge it's learned and so in in what sense can the disembodied soul be called a human person mm -hmm. yeah no this is a um huge debate among Thomas. I, I mean it's still very active in the literature right now there's a uh an issue that came out just this year or, or 2020 of um the journal uh questiones disputate disputed questions um uh, it's an issue on hylomorphism in general, but there, in a, there's a subsection uh, debate among four of us uh, on this uh, notion. So, yeah, for, for listeners who aren't fully aware of this debate, so there's the, the two labels that are used are survivalism and corruptionism. Mm -hmm. The corruptionists argue um, that at the moment of death, when the soul separates from the body that's now the corpse left behind, um, that this is a corruption of the substance that is the human person. So the human person, properly speaking, has gone out of existence. And all that persists is a part of them. Yes, a very important part. Yeah. Yes, a part that uh, can serve as the principle of a persistent identity, but again, not personal identity. Um, and it's only when that persistent form, the persistent soul, informs new matter provided by God to reconstitute the full human person that the person comes back into existence. Mm -hmm. um, the survivalists, on the other hand, argue that the soul in its separated state suffices uh, to compose the, the same human person. Um, yes, we're not saying that the person is identical to the soul, right? Again, we're still uh, eschewing any form of substance dualism. Uh, Aquinas, in his commentary um, on the Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, clearly states, anima mea non est ego, my soul is not me. Mm -hmm. But in, in, uh, in contemporary analytic metaphysics, we talk about the difference between identity and constitution or composition without identity. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that my soul suffices to compose me, to constitute me, but I'm not strictly speaking identical to my soul. Yeah. Now the question is why would one favor one over the other? Um, the other, especially when, so corruptionism seems to, on the, on the one hand, fit best with Thomistic metahylomorphism in the sense that, well, if, we're saying there's two metaphysical parts, soul and body, and both are essential for the person to exist. If you don't have the one, then you don't have the substance. So 
right? But then you run into all sorts of problems. So for example, you talked about the intercession of the saints. Mm. Um, and Aquinas addresses this very argument. Um, I, I personally, um, I, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the book, I, re, I profess agnosticism on the question of whether Aquinas should be best read as a survivalist or a corruptionist. Right. And, and there are really good arguments and textual interpretation to support that we ought to read Aquinas as a corruptionist. Um, so for example, when he talks about when, when you pray to St. Peter, you're not praying to St. Peter, you're praying to Peter's soul, right? Okay. And Peter's soul can intercede for you and so on. But then here's a problem where Aquinas is arguably himself being inconsistent. He says that prayer is the act of a person. Only persons pray. Um, and now, you know, maybe there's a way of reinterpreting that passage to make it consistent with the former. Um, but the point being is that there's, when we think about what the separated soul does on Aquinas' own terms, it can think, it can pray, it's self-aware. And it's not just thinking, it's also willing, right? The volition is part of the intellective aspect of the soul. My separated soul can experience the beatific vision. It can enter into a loving relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, and, and all these things just begin intuitively seem like these are the acts of persons and various of them Aquinas says at various points, these are things that persons do and non-persons. Yeah. So how can we say that the soul is not a person? So I would argue, uh, particularly in that latest article that came out that whether or not Aquinas was a corruptionist, he should have been a survivalist. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Um, hmm. And in, I guess in what sense um, could the sort of disembodied soul be called a human and an animal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a, literally the debate I'm having on a blog right now with some colleagues. Um, okay. So a good friend of mine, um, David Hershenoff, he's a philosopher at the University of Buffalo and a hylomorphist. Um, He's not a strict Thomas. His wife is a Thomas. So sometimes they publish things together when they want to uh, do, do Thomistic things. But uh, he often, he's a hylomorphist, um, but he reads, hylo, he has a more animalistic type hylomorphism. It's a, it's a little bit more okay. reductive than mine. Um, but, but, so one of the things that, that David argues is that, yeah, the, the, to say that the separated soul is, the person, if a person is essentially an animal, then, then you have this weird phenomenon of a bodiless animal, right? So his solution to that, because he's, he's actually a survivalist, is to say that human persons are not essentially animals, mm. which that's a perfectly coherent position, but that's clearly flies in the face of everything Aquinas says about human persons. Um, and so, so if I'm going to be a Thomistic survivalist, I have to bite the bullet and say that, you know, the, the animal's still there. Now, well, why would I think that, right? Why would I say that the animal's still present? Yeah. So go back to the persistent vegetative state. This is, this is a, a point, I, a connection I make in that latest paper in the Questionis Disputate um, article. I say, look, we said about the, the, the PVS patient that even though... The, there's no matter that allows for thought to occur or even consciousness, sentience at a basic animal level, that there's still a person because those powers are still there. They're latent, but they're still there, even though there's no material organs that will allow them to be manifest, right? And why do we say the animal's still there? Well, because vegetation's still happening, right? There's still of the three essential classes of activities that the soul engages in, it's one of them still there and active. Well, this is just a mirror image of that, right? Now, rationality, intellection, that's the thing that's still happening. So mm -hmm. there's that activity. But Aquinas is very clear. If you have the soul present because one of its set of activities are active, its other powers are there too, even if they're latent. Yeah. So if we say that, latent rationality 
in the PBS patient is enough to say that the person is there. Mm -hmm. latent, and latent sentience and latent vegetation, I argue, is enough to say that the animal is present. Okay. But the, I, have to, I have to then say that animals are not essentially body embodied. Yeah. Not essentially material. And that's, just, and, that's, and that's where Dave Hershenoff and I specifically disagree. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'll have to check out that. What, what's the blog called? Just out of curiosity. Um, so, um, so David directs this center called the Ramanel Center. I think it's called Ramanel Center for Bioethics uh, at the University of Buffalo. Um, I can send you the link offline. Yeah. And, um, and the, 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 the bloggers are there by invitation only, um, but, but the public can view the blog and you know, the results of our conversation. And, and actually this particular point of debate has been happening offline in an email exchange, but I might go ahead and write something into the blog, maybe even later today. Um, but the blog is interesting. They, they, uh, it's usually, it's always based around some article that one of the members of the, uh, of the Ramanel Center fellows um, uh, bring in. So we, so for example, we've been talking about this paper by uh, the physician and philosopher and theologian Dan Macy at Georgetown University um, on brain death, um, mm -hmm. how we, we opt to define death. So that's been the subject of the debate between all of us uh, who are involved in the Ramanel Center. And then, um, and then once the blog closes, we usually like debate for like a week or 10 days. And then, so Macy as the author can come in and respond to everything we've said, okay. <laughs> to the extent that he wants to. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. But, but I, because of this link between brain death and, and, you know, the post-mortem existence, then that's kind of, these two debates become intertwined. Okay. Yeah. No, that sounds interesting. Um, I have one last question for you. Sure. And uh, this one comes from IJ, who's unfortunately oh. not able to be here for this. Tell him I said hi. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, well, I guess, well, first of all, would you say that, um, like humanity is traditionally defined as a rational animal. Uh, now, are those uh, sort of functional concepts? Um, we have the the power of of self movement. Uh, we're able to sustain ourselves, and we have the the ability to to self reflect and and know abstract truths. Because um, it's not like a rational animal. It's not necessarily a biological definition. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if we were to discover other, other species, uh, say, you know, potentially if we were to learn more about dolphin intellection, or we were to um, encounter extraterrestrials, mm -hmm. uh, what's to stop us from calling uh, them human as well? Uh, how would we sort of differentiate uh, human persons from dolphin persons, from insectoid persons from the planet Mars? Yeah, so I think that, the key is it, it, what you said at the very end of your question. I think the right taxonomy here is the genus is person. Okay. And the specific difference are whatever these biological qualities are that differentiate us into, you know, humans, dolphins, Klingons, Vulcans, right? Okay. Um, maybe even androids, right? And the, the point being is that because um, God is three persons on a standard you know, Trinitarian uh, notion mm -hmm. and uh, angels and demons exist as Aquinas defines them as essentially immaterial intellects. But he says the term person applies to them as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Aquinas himself is using person as his genus concept. Um, and so, and so we have the divine persons, we have angelic persons and we have human persons. So I do think that the right way to think about us um, is as either rational animals or maybe better human persons, because I do think there can be other rational animals who are not human. Okay. Um, and part of what's really uh, sparked my, my thinking of this is not only, as I mentioned before, I am a trekker, I am a sci-fi nerd, so yeah. I'm very much open to the possibility of, of extraterrestrial intelligent life. Um, and also, you know, to the extent I've looked at various studies related to animal cognition and so on, there, there's some very compelling data there that I think we need to take into account. Um, the famous neo-Aristotelian philosopher Alistair McIntyre has this uh, wonderful book um, called Dependent Rational Animals. Mm. And he spends the whole, the first two, three chapters, are talk he's talking about dolphins. 
And yeah. then he's drawing connections between how dolphins formulate and are able to engage in practical reasoning and com then comparing that to how humans engage in practical reasoning. And so, again, I'm personally agnostic on the, I don't know if dolphins have a rational soul or not, um, mm -hmm. I'm, but I'm open to that. I don't, th I don't think there's anything metaphysically incoherent in the possibility that they do um, or any aliens. Um, artificial intelligence, that's a bit trickier again, it goes right. back to this question of whether something purely material could engage in um, in thought, but you know, again, data on Star Trek, the Cylons on Battlestar Galactica. Um, who knows, right? Um, you know, God has, in His wisdom, has not only you know created intelligent creatures in in the form of us and maybe other animals and aliens, but God has also imbued matter with a lot of power. Right? There's a lot of power to the non-mental physical world. And so I, I, I'm not 100% convinced that the argument that a purely material process couldn't generate something immaterial, like an intellective mind, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure that argument is going to continue to hold up. Um, okay. But for now, I, I stick with it. <laughs> um, so the point then being is that yeah we um, uh, yeah we should we should oh I, I was saying earlier sorry to to I lost my train of thought there one of the things that really got me thinking along these lines is not only my love of sci-fi but also um, thinking about the real life case of uh, human non-human chimeras okay um, yeah I co-published a paper with one of my former grad students a while back on this phenomenon where scientists graft human cells, usually human stem cells of some sort into non-human animals. Mm -hmm. And they do this for various purposes. So for example, there's a, a mouse, and there's not just one, there, you can, there's thousands of them. You can, scientists can order them and do research with them. But it's called the skid hue mouse. Um, skid is an acronym, I forget exactly what it stands for. Uh, the hue is human. Um, yeah. But the idea is that what the skid hue mouse is, it's basically a mouse with a human immune system. Mm -hmm. And so it has human T cells, human white blood cells, right? Uh, a human lymphatic system, right? All those things, but everything else about it, it's, it's a mouse, right? Yeah. And they even started doing experiments. Um, and this is uh, coming back into the fore of conversation, doing experiments grafting human neural stem cells into animals. Right. And of course, you know, this raises some concerns about a plan of the ape scenario where yeah. um, if, if we, we do this wrong. So that's definitely much more tricky. But the, the point being is that it seems theoretically possible that if you engraft enough human, um, you know, human neurally differentiated cells into, especially an animal that say is a close evolutionary cousin, like a, uh, you know, some, some member of the, of the ape uh, species, set of species, um, because they have a you know, pretty large cranial capacity, their brains are already capable of pretty sophisticated thought. So even if they're not rational yet, it seems possible that we could fairly easily turn them into rational animals. Right. At which point, whether it's God infusing a rational soul or the rational soul emerges naturally from this, then they would be persons. Okay. Might be. Interesting. Um, well, yeah, I just wanted to thank you again for, for coming on. Um, yeah, so where, where can our listeners find you online? You've, you've mentioned this blog, but do you have your own personal blog? Are you on social media? Uh, so I don't have a personal blog. I, I am on some social media. Um, okay. uh, I'm on Facebook and I'm on uh, LinkedIn and ResearchGate. I have a profile. Okay. Um, those are the main things. I, I don't do Twitter, Instagram, any of that stuff. I'm okay. Fair I, I don't want to say I'm too old for it, but I, I, I it's just that I can't keep up. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I shouldn't, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I nothing against those th platforms. Um, but we do. So one thing I would recommend if, um, if someone goes on Facebook, uh, feel free to, to, you know, friend request me, uh, I'm very open about accepting friend requests, but also, um, SLU Bioethics, so SLU for St. Louis University, and mm -hmm. then Bioethics. 
Uh, we have both a Facebook and a Twitter page, which is for our bioethics center. And we have a lot of um, faculty and graduate students doing some very interesting work, um, mm -hmm. not only in some, some more practical bioethics things like clinical ethics and research ethics, public health ethics, but in more foundational philosophy and theology. Um, our PhD program has, a, we have a joint program with the theology department at SLU. Yeah. And this, this year began a joint program with the philosophy department at SLU. Um, and we have several, again, philosophers, theologians uh, on our faculty. And so uh, if you, I, I would yeah, recommend, yeah, people want to kind of track some really interesting work in, in the intersection of bioethics and, and biotechnology more broadly with philosophy and theology, uh, definitely follow the SLU bioethics site. Um, so yeah. Okay. And um, uh, I'd also like to just mention that you, uh, well, you're the editor of several books on both Star Trek and Star Wars and philosophy, and you, you have a new book that will be coming out soon. Um, so yeah, um, why don't you just say a quick word about that sure, so yeah. our listeners can watch out for it. Yeah, so the, the, I've uh, co-edited with a good friend of mine, Kevin Decker, um, two books on, on Star Wars and philosophy. So one's just called Star Wars and philosophy, the other's called The Ultimate Star Wars and philosophy. Um, but now the publisher, they've been so successful, I think they've sold together around almost 50,000 copies. Um, the publisher wants us to do a third volume, particularly with all the exciting developments in the Star Wars uh, universe with the Mandalorian and all like, there's like six new TV shows in production right now and the yeah. new movies. So, uh, so now we're doing uh, Star Wars and Philosophy Strikes Back. Um, and for those who are listening who are um, philosophers or, you know, you may, maybe you have a, a, a PhD or you're a grad student in another discipline uh, like theology or English or history or something, but you know, you're very philosophically minded. Um, if you have an interest in, um, in potentially in making a proposal to write a chapter for this book, because we're, we're currently soliciting proposals, um, go to uh, www.andphilosophy, run together, andphilosophy.com. Um, because all the books in this series are all X and philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. And so the publisher started this website and all the calls for abstracts for any new books. Um, another new one that actually my friend Kevin is doing is on Dune and philosophy with a new movie mm -hmm. coming out. So okay. any Dune fans out there, check that out. Okay, great. And we'll include links of all that in the description. Um, so yeah, bye for now and thanks for listening. Yeah. All right. Um, sorry, I'm just going to.